Welcome to The Tax Factor, the top 20 business and investment podcast from Blick Rothenberg, the tax, accounting and business advisory firm. This week with Rob Goodley and Rahana Earl. Hello, I'm Rob Goodley and welcome to The Tax Factor, the top tax podcast that keeps you up to date on all the latest tax news and updates. I'm not sure how we can top the excitement of last week's budget special, but we're going to give it a go. Joining me this week is my colleague at Blick Rothenberg, Rahana Earl. Thanks, Rob. So uh, indeed, it's been a, a busy week for us, especially those working with non-domiciled individuals. You and I, I think, have both been poring over and digesting all the announcements from the budget. And in last week's episode, Namesh and Heather shared some initial reactions, and we will continue to share thoughts from Blick Rothenberg over the coming weeks. Unfortunately for all the tax lovers listening today, we don't have time to do a deep dive into the technical content. But Rob, I know you think there are some other broader aspects to the proposed changes, which haven't featured prominently in the press over the past week or so. What are your thoughts on these? So I've got to be careful here, Rahana, because our producer has said I can't spend the whole podcast talking about the non-DOM changes. And he's right to say that because it's a topic that's going to feature heavily on the podcast this year, I think. However, as you say, I do think there are some important kind of broader aspects to last week's non-DOM announcements that haven't attracted as much attention in the mainstream media as I I think they should have. And I, I simply couldn't let this opportunity pass without comment. Sort of three things that stick out for me. So the first one is the timetable. On the face of it, there's 13 months between now and 6th of April 25 when the new rules are supposed to come into force, which is a good amount of time to legislate for the proposed changes. However, given that we are almost certainly going to have an autumn election and there is a long summer recess between now and then, time's actually really tight. It would need to be a rush job, basically. New legislation would simply need to be pushed through Parliament with no time allocated for a kind of a feedback loop with the advisor community. And in previous instances where the non dom rules have significantly changed, the government hasn't got the legislation right first time. And they've only discovered that once they've received feedback from advisors. My fear is that the government may just legislate this and will have real problems down the track as a result. The other aspect of the timetable is is kind of political. I'm just sort of wondering, really, do the Conservative Party even want to legislate before the election? Perhaps in kind of a shrewd political move, they leave the kind of implementation issues to the Labour Party to deal with if they form the new government in in 2025. Potentially something that could cause some divisions in the Labour Party in the early formation of the government because they have to decide if they go ahead with what the Conservatives have put forward or or do something slightly different. So I could see that perhaps leading to a delay, maybe a year or more, but who knows? But I think it's, it's a big unknown for me at the moment. The second one, Again, political is the government's objectives. I keep thinking what what are they trying to achieve with this new regime, which now has a four year time period, as opposed to what is effectively a 15 year time period we have now. Seems to me that the point of having any sort of regime like this is to encourage international talent, especially entrepreneurial talent, to come to the UK and create wealth here. I'm slightly worried that this new regime is going to encourage a more transient type of immigration, which won't lead to the same levels of wealth creation. Our colleague Winnie Chow made the really good point that there's actually a bit of an incongruence between this four-year period and the usual five-year period that someone immigrating here needs before they can apply for indefinite leave to remain. So I just worry about tactically, you know, how well that's been thought through. And then the last point is kind of maybe an opportunity or a strategic one is measuring the impact. So whatever people might think of these changes, it seems to me there's a, a unique opportunity for the government to gather real world data on the impact of this change. I think it's gonna be hugely important because if we discover it's not working, we can then, you know, have an informed debate based on real numbers as to what we should do and whether that time frame of four years should be pushed out or or something else. So yeah. In short, I'll keep it tight. I think we're going to be in for a bumpy ride in 2024 on the on these non-DOM changes. Yeah, I mean, I 100% agree, Rob. And just that that four-year period, as you say, is really, really interesting and how that also compares to other regimes in other countries. Portugal, obviously making some changes to theirs, but you know other countries who have much longer time periods in place. So it'll be really interesting to see kind of what happens there, as you say, in order to kind of attract less transient talent going forward. I think the other thing to sort of really be aware of is that it's going to be quite hard for people to plan in this period now because we don't really know, as you say, whether it's going to come into force or not, if it does, what it's actually going to look like. So people need to be thinking about it. But what do they actually do? And I think it's right to have the conversations, but it's going to be a complex time for people to sort of plan over the next year regarding their, their personal situations. Outside of the nom-dom changes, the Chancellor also announced a few other measures I think are worth highlighting within the budget. And one of those was the UK ISA, which I think is really good news for savers. The UK ISA is going to extend the tax-free allowance to 25k 
today, Jeremy Hunt sounded confident when announcing this at the budget. He said to MPs, in quotes, I will introduce a brand new British ISA, which will allow an additional 5,000 allowance for investments in UK equity with all the tax advantages of other ISAs. As with other ISAs, the UK ISA is going to be capital gains tax free, which is obviously good news. It's estimated that 27 million adults use an ISA for their savings, holding a total value of 687 billion. So this is really likely to be a popular measure for those that can save an extra 5k a year. It's not going to be possible to open a UK ISA and then transfer the balance out to another type of ISA. Um, However, investors will be free to release the funds from other ISAs and then reinvest them within a UK ISA or transfer to another UK ISA or hold the funds outside the ISA. So it's anticipated as well that the ability to divert an extra 5k from other investments into ISAs each year will reduce the overall tax liability over 10 years by roughly £13,000. Again, I think really good news for savers here if this comes to fruition. Another announcement that I think will make those that uh, love films, TV and theatre happy is that the government has announced a total of £1 billion in tax relief, which has been designated over the next five years to support the creative industries. Film studios are going to get the biggest tax breaks with 40% relief from business rates over the next 10 years to promote investment into new studios across the UK. And that relief is going to be available from the 1st of April 2024. The Chancellor said, again in quotes, we have become Europe's largest film and TV production centre with the likes of Idris Elba, Kira Knightley and Orlando Bloom all filming their latest productions here. So clear that there's a desire to kind of continue to invest in this area. Apparently, studio space in the UK has doubled in the last three years and the current rate of expansion, apparently we're going to be second only to Hollywood globally by the end of 2025. So lots of film, TV, etc. happening in the UK. There's a studio being developed in Sunderland and apparently another 30 proposed new studios across the UK. The announcement is really expected to help incentivize filmmakers to use homegrown talent and technology and drive growth in what is really seen as a dynamic sector for the UK. There's also going to be a new independent film tax credit at a rate of 53% for films with a budget of less than 15 million, provided it meets the conditions set by the British Film Institute, uh, along with a 5% increase increase in tax relief for UK visual effects costs in film and high-end TV. Theatres, orchestras, museums and galleries are set to receive 26.4 million to upgrade infrastructure as well as permanent extension to, to relevant tax reliefs. Definitely some good news there for the arts industries. Rob, anything else that you think is worthy of a mention from last week? Yes, as you know, Rohana, the government produced a useful Excel document with every budget, which has a line item for each policy announcement and its expected impact on the Exchequer. And this is always one of the first documents I open up as the numbers can tell really quite an interesting story. A big number that jumped out to me, you know, other than the obviously the, the really headline grabbing ones around Nick was the one year extension to the energy profits levy. That's forecast to bring in 1.5 billion of tax revenue extra, obviously a big number and that will have helped the Chancellor significantly in his attempts to balance the books. Whilst a smaller measure financially, the Chancellor also announced an increase to air passenger duty on business and first class flights which starts from 2025. Can't help but feel there's a bit of an incongruence there with the fuel duty freeze. There's not really a consistent policy from the government. It just felt like another place that the Chancellor felt that he could grab a bit of revenue. But the, the main item that really struck me was that over the forecast period, the, the Chancellor's forecasting an additional 4.3 billion of additional revenue from investing in better debt management capabilities at HMRC. Now, I'm sure every taxpayer will be really happy to hear that we're investing in HMRC's debt recovery capacity. 4.3 billion feels like a huge target to hit, and I I really highly doubt we'll we'll hit that in practice. And again, I think the overall feeling, which has been in the press, is that the Chancellor's really kind of back-ended a lot of the tax raising measures to see the the books balanced. And, you know, I I, I think some of those numbers are, are highly speculative. So might be a a difficult inheritance for the next the next government indeed yeah i mean i I agree the 4.3 billion feels like a a ridiculous target and in reality so we will have to see where that goes but thanks rob so that wraps up our budget overview for this episode and we're now going to move on to a few other things that have kind of hit the news in the last week or so so i wanted to talk about the tax advisory industry itself and the fact that the government is planning to strengthen regulations to crack down on what they're calling rogue tax agents the main purpose of this really being in the words of nigel huddleston who is an mp and financial secretary 
Secretary to the Treasury, that it's to deal with a small number of practitioners who are basically incompetent, unprofessional or unscrupulous, but who continue to operate, both harming their clients and the public finances. In the last tax factor episode that I did uh, with Ellie, uh, we spoke about cracking down on promoters of tax avoidance schemes. And I think all these measures together are really linked in terms of trying to make sure that people receive the right advice and are not put at risk themselves um, going forward. So this is absolutely the right thing to do. And HMRC have now launched a consultation on potential measures which will help the clamp down on uh, rogue advisors, including those who provide tax advice without any professional qualifications. And HMRC themselves said that almost Anyone can start providing tax advice and services to clients and can do so with limited or no oversight if they're not a member of a professional body. The fact that people can do that, I think, creates mistrust in the system and also increased costs for HMRC and the taxpayer. So the consultation is really focused on a tougher regulatory framework, um, but there's still lots of discussion to be had on what that's actually going to look like. And I think it's a case of watch this space for the industry going forward. I think that's right, Rohanna. I think it's good news, isn't it? The industry needs to be regulated. We need to get these people who shouldn't shouldn't be in the market out of the market so that it's just left with people who are giving the right advice. There was one other matter that I wanted to, to raise, which is kind of small, but I think it's worth mentioning because it's going to impact so, so many people, is that the government is planning to do away with the government gateway. So they're going to replace it effectively with well with a new system which is called gov.uk one login not particularly catchy but basically that will make all online government services available in a single place so i think it'll just be much easier for taxpayers and agents once that's put into place the transition is going to take three years which is probably slightly longer than we would like but i think it's a really positive move again a, a simplification which is always good the final thing i think rahana is you had some news on crypto yeah i mean crypto is one of those things i don't think it's been in the spotlight as much recently but it's definitely kind of still there in the background with HMRC wanting to police it more because they know that they're sort of losing revenue in this in this area. HMRC are now consulting on the implementation of a global transparency rules and are seeking views on how best to implement the OECD's crypto asset reporting framework, which is known as CARF. The new rules should mean that crypto platforms will have to share client data directly with HMRC, which will make it much, much harder for crypto investors to avoid paying capital gains tax on any gains that they do make. The UK has signed up to the rules and the consultation is really focusing on the reporting requirements. So the types of assets that will be covered, for example, the scope of reportable users, as well as tax residency identification. The consultation is also looking at what is classed as a crypto platform and a crypto asset service provider for the purposes of providing and sharing data with HMRC. The Treasury estimates that the transparency regulations are going to bring in approximately 95 million per year. So, you know, it's it's definitely something that they want to focus on. And I think, again, something that we need to look out for and, and watch this space on as the new rules develop. I think it's good. The government will find a lot of non-compliance and hopefully clear it up, which is good news. So I think that's about all we have time for today. If you want more information and detail on the Chancellor's statement, Blick Rothenberg has a comprehensive budget hub, which is updated with insights and analysis from our team of experts and features our famous tax calculator. So you can see if you are better or worse off, hopefully not. It's the UK's top calculator and has had nearly 25 million impressions since it was released after the budget last week, which is an absolutely fantastic number. So please do go and download our free tax facts guide, have a look at the calculator, and please keep updated on our website for any budget announcements. Thanks to Rahana for joining me this week. The Tax Factor is back next week with Matt Crawford and Ellie Theachari. I'm Rob Goodley. Thanks for listening and goodbye. That's the Tax Factor. We'd like to thank you for making us one of the UK's top 20 podcasts. Find all our previous episodes wherever you get your podcasts and join us again next time on the Tax Factor. Tax Factor.